Uh, we've got an exciting regulatory webinar. As I said in my post earlier, I promise that's a thing. Um, we'll be talking today about running a freelance or virtual law firm in 2020 uh, with uh, the SRA. We've got some fantastic speakers uh, lined up. We've got uh, Emma Townley, who is policy manager at the Solicitors Regulatory Authority. We've got uh, Janet Farrell, uh, loyal policy associate. Um, I'm going to call him Jay uh, because he's allowed me to. Thank you very much, Jay, for that. Uh, and we've got Guy Stern, uh, CEO and founder of Legal Connection. Uh, later uh, this afternoon, we're also going to be having uh, Jeff Dunnett, uh, who is the Professional Services Director at Shield Pay, uh, joining us in about half an hour for his uh, part of the session. Uh, could you please uh, explain to us briefly what is the concept of uh, legal freelancer? Um, Timo, thank you. Yeah, so a freelancer basically is someone that, that we regard as practicing on their own. So the way the regulations are written in the, the SRA standards and regulations is that it's a, a solicitor just practicing on their own. So we, it's someone that's um, not employed, doesn't have employees. Um, they're mobile in terms of how they work and how they operate, who they're working with. Um, and in terms of how they engage with their clients, it's exactly the same, that they're just, you know, it's a freelance model. You're not engaging with a law firm and there's no structure around you in the sense that you haven't got back office staff or you haven't got um, other partners that you're working with. So you are purely just working on your own. So in terms of a freelance system, that's what, we've, that's what we see a freelancer as, that it's someone working and practicing on their own. It's a, it's a newly introduced um, kind of regulation in place. Uh, overall, could you tell us uh, whether those freelancers are subject to the same regulations as uh, the conventional kind of law practice that we've got? Yeah, this is interesting, this is, because this is where we did get some feedback or where there's been a little bit of, um, should we say, um, a few grey areas where people haven't understood the freelancer model. So through the standards and regulations, when we launched on the 25th of November, what we had was a whole suite of regulations coming through. So there was the SRA principles, the SRA code of conduct for solicitors, the code of conduct for firms, the authorization rules um, and our enforcement strategy and the disciplinary rules. So for solicitors that are working as freelancers, it's really important to note that they're still subject to firstly the SRA principles. So they're bound by the duty. These are ethical principles as well. So it's duty to act in the client's best interests, um, to act with integrity, to act with honesty. Um, so they're ethical behaviors that apply regardless of how the solicitors practice or whatever badge they've given themselves. Um, secondly, the Solicitor's Code of Conduct for individual solicitors, European lawyers or, or foreign lawyers, again, it's important to, to understand that this code of conduct, again, will apply to freelancers as does it to a partner working in a global city firm or whether it's a recognised sole practitioner or whether it's a partner in a traditional partnership setup. It doesn't matter where the solicitor's working, how they're working. So this code of conduct sets out standards. So not the ethical behaviours, but the standards that we expect of someone practising as a solicitor. So we'll have things like, you know, that they need to comply with undertakings, how they service their clients, give them the best possible information, um, duties to maintain um, and protect client confidentiality, not act where there's a conflict. So all of those sort of standards that apply to a solicitor, regardless of where they work, will apply to a freelance solicitor as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one question to you, Emma. I know that uh, the, the regulation has been in place since November 2019. How many people have registered under, under that group? And have you seen kind of spike at the beginning and then a slowdown or, or has it been kind of consistent uh, registrations under under freelance solicitor uh, group? Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Yeah, I think um, the, the stats are evolving every day, obviously. I think we've got over, over 100 registered freelancers now, um, but that will include those that, that are doing reserved work as well as un, un, uh, unreserved as well as reserved work. Um, I think we, we did have a flurry at the beginning. Um, it's uh, stable, stay a bit stable at the moment, but obviously we're in we're in, a, we're in a particularly difficult environment at the moment. So 
um, whilst registrations may, may have tailed off more recently. Mm. I suspect that there's bigger forces at play um, uh, uh, around that. Thank you. Uh, Guy, I've got a question for you. I, I know that uh, while designing a legal connection, you've had that very particular group in mind. Uh, could you tell us um, how did you spot that emerging trend? Uh, why is it important to you to focus on this very small subset? Is it going to remain small? Do you envision that there will be, there will be more people practicing uh, under that group? Sure. Uh, thanks, Timo. Thanks for having me as well. Um, so yeah, we're Legal Connection. We're a startup. And um, often when you're in the startup ecosystem, you are looking to find something that's uh, starting out and growing, a trend that's uh, just taking off. So last year when we heard that in November 2019, there was going to be a big regulation change uh, within the legal sector, obviously we looked at our own product and saw how can we... Um, how can we sort of gear our product to, to make the optimal use out of this out of this regulation uh, moment? Um, our product, you'll see it in a bit. It, it is a tool for remote working and for for lawyers that work by themselves for themselves. I used to call them coffee shop lawyers, but now you know <laughs> that's obviously quite evolved, and now we're all in some ways working uh, working remotely. Um, but but yeah. The, I, I, I knew about this SRA regulation. I then uh, tried my best to get in touch with the SRA. I met Emma <laughs> at, um, at an event at Hogan Levels and I sort of brought my phone up to her and showed it to her. <laughs> this is the, the app that we're building around the, um, the, the freelance solicitors, or she told me the word freelance solicitors, we were calling them solos. And yeah, it, it, um, it began a conversation, obviously, which, uh, which you know now a few months later leads up to this webinar. Thank you, Guy. Uh, Jatinda, I've got a question to you. Um, we know that uh, often the, the legal community overall could, could be quite stubborn uh, when, when novelties are being introduced. Uh, could you tell us like, what has been the reaction of the, of the wider uh, uh, community under the SRA? Yeah, sure. I think when we first put the proposal out to consult, it was that, you know, people have that immediate knee-jerk reaction to say, you know, what's this that, you know, the sort of, in the headlines, it was that, you know, we're dil diluting the profession so that we were going to create another brand of solicitor. Um, but when you, once you start speaking to people um, and going through the concept in terms of how they work, and like, as we mentioned previously now, that the the protect the, the regulatory standards that apply to these freelance solicitors, people start understanding the concept a little bit more. And yeah, if you were using Guy's term every day in, in sort of the, the news, you know, these are coffee shop lawyers, you'd probably think, okay, where are they leaving their stuff? You know, yeah. is, is there a worry that they'll leave their briefcase behind or, or their laptop switched on whilst they're getting their next flat white? Um, but no, once you start talking about how the model's going to actually, you know, what it's there to do and who it's there to serve, people have started to come around. So that resistance that we had at the probably the early stages when we were out to consult and some of the formal responses as well that we had to consultation, which said that this was completely the wrong thing to be doing. Once you start speaking to people, Timo, and getting them to understand, okay, this is what the freelancer model does. And Emma picked up on a really important point as well, which is that there's technically two types of freelancers, one that's doing the unreserved work and those that are doing reserved work. And if you think about it, those that are doing the unreserved work, they probably fall into camps such as will writing, um, GDPR, data protection advice, that sort of stuff. And those sort of models or those sort of teams or businesses, those coffee shop lawyers have been out there for ages, um, because but they're calling themselves as will writers or legal consultants, whereas now they'll be able to call themselves a solicitor. The other side, which is the reserve legal activities, that's where we've set out some really key restrictions as well. So when we were talking about the standards or the regulations that apply, when you're doing reserved work, there is still an element of protection that we think that needs to be in place. So we've introduced some conditions to make sure that it's quite clear that these are freelance solicitors. And as I mentioned, that, you know, no employees or they can't be employed. They can't practice out of a service company. So you can't be Jatinder Loyal Limited. It just has to be Jatinder Loyal as the individual. Mm. Um, they're not allowed to hold any client money, so transactional money. So that's a really important point as well as part of how solicitors or lawyers normally practice that they tend to be used to be holding clients of money, you know, sums of money for clients. Um, and the other point that we introduced was that they, these individuals must have adequate and appropriate insurance. So we're not prescribing the level of insurance that they have to have for doing the reserved work and then any other work that they do, but they need to have insurance in place. 
Uh, pl yeah. pl please hold, hold that thought because I have some money questions later on. Maybe over to you, Emma. No, I was just going to add to that. I think uh, initially people just perceive there to be a, a reduction in consumer pr protections mm. associated with this type of uh, practice. Um, and the more and more people get to understand actually that there are risk mitigants in, in, the, in the way that we've gone about this, uh, the more people are accepting or even embracing of the, fa of the opportunities that, 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 that our flexibilities allow. It's a question of understanding, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just just one, one quick note. I just put forward the first poll to our audience. Uh, the question to you guys today is, what are your thoughts on going solo? Uh, there are four possible answers. I'm going to keep that up for the next 120 seconds, and then I'm going to move to the next one. So please be swift. Um, so I've got actually a follow-up question uh, on that uh, to you, uh, Emma. Uh, can you Can you tell us? Um, essentially how important innovation is to driving that change. The change in um, freelance model. Correct. Yeah. Well, I think from, from first principles, um, the review of our handbook was, was, was partly driven by a desire to have rules that allowed for innovation. So it's quite fundamental in, in the sense that we tried, well, we try, we have remo removed prescription from our rules. That means that uh, the way that solicitors or firms uh, achieve compliance, it, we're agnostic, for example, to tech uh, is, you know, and it, it, if it allows people to do things in different ways and people to practice in different ways. So yes, uh, you know, innovation was at the heart of, of our, you know, it, the, the desire to achieve innovation was at the heart of, of our review of the, of the handbook, as well as obviously making sure we had the right standards um, in place that, that solicitors must, must, must meet. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and that leads me to a question to, to you, Guy. Um, I mean, how do you, as, a new, as the innovator, uh, view the regulations? and uh, what has been your impression and your experience with uh, uh, dealing with the uh, SRA itself? Yeah, look, I, I think we, we got lucky. As, as Emma says, you know, the, the tech is sometimes a bit of an enabler to new business models and regulators, you know, they, they need to react to, to trends that are forming. So if you look at sort of the Uber, you know, the gig economy as it happened, in many ways, sometimes tech runs away with something and then the regulators catch up. Obviously, with the legal profession, things are planned out um, and, and thought through a little bit more. It's a heavily regulated industry. So, yeah, so we, we just happen to be, I guess, in the right place at the right time because I'd been building a product that helps a lawyer run their practice from their phone, run their practice from their laptop, connect to other lawyers within their professional networks in, in a way that speaks to the, the LinkedIn um, sort of network effects. Um, and so when we saw the, the regulation and we, when we started to understand it, we started to realize, um, you know, that it's the, the product that we were building and, and the, the regulations that were coming into effect kind of had, a, a, you know, a, a lot of um, interesting um, parallels. And I think uh, when, I, when I first showed you the app, Emma, I said to you, look, we built this app around the freelancer model. <laughs> and you said to me, wow, how did you know? Because I said <laughs> Um, so obviously, that uh, we did, I didn't know about the SRA regulations yeah. when I started working on the app, but um, yeah, we, we definitely I definitely was looking at the principles that apply within other verticals within the gig economy, um, the way that you know I saw the industry moving. So I've got my uh, second question to the audience. Uh, if you're thinking of becoming a freelance solicitor, does the SRA guidance on freelance solicitors give you enough to help uh, to make that decision? So uh, again, you guys will have two minutes, and uh, I have another question uh, to you, Emma, in the meantime. Um, essentially, users of legal services want instant access to information overall. So are Apple Android apps the way forward? Are those you know, being recommended? Are, are we still kind of shying away and, and, and keeping up to the traditional way of, of uh, servicing people? Yeah, I mean, um, I think if you, the, 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 what's happening now in this in this really difficult time is is showing how tra traditionally I think uh, legal services consumers have shied a bit a bit away from from tech because they're so used to this face to face contact and 
with that in some way the concept that that, that of trust in 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 the face to face contact um but i think we are and we will be seeing more of a shift um towards consumers uh, and, and and law firms being more accepting of, of virtual and online um, ways of interacting with lawyers, not only because they're being forced to do that in the, in, in the current environment, um, but also because we as a regulator are taking much more confident steps, I suppose, in terms mm. of our role, our role and position on, on tech um, and how it can support access to justice. So, um, you know, we, we've been running a, a challenge process um, with some funding that we secured through the Regulators Pioneer funding Fund, and that's enabling us to, to speak confidently about the challenges and opportunities of tech uh, and, you know, develop the role that we, we see ourselves play, playing there in terms of guidance and support for consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, I, I've got a difficult question for you, Jatinder. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you confirm for us that uh, solicitor can provide legal ser services through an unauthorized uh, entity? Um, so, Timo, yeah, this is the point that I was mentioning before. That what we have is um, the concept of reserved and unreserved legal activities. Mm -hmm. So, what you have is that the unreserved legal activities are those that we mentioned, things like will writing, data protection advice, mm -hmm. um, you know, employment stroke HR advice, so mm -hmm. that sort of thing in house. Um, there's there's a whole raft of you know whether you're looking at things like welfare social social security sort of benefits that sort of advice that all of those can be done outside of an authorized firm and they are already being provided by should we say lawyers using that title um through different businesses or different setups so what you have is that the the regulations the way they moved was that yeah these solicitors now if they want to practice in the unreserved space they can call themselves a solicitor prior to that they were calling themselves non-practicing or like i said legal consultants or giving themselves some other title um, in terms of the reserved work that's where you have um, the limitations and conditions so as we've always seen traditionally that a solicitor has to practice either as a recognized sole practitioner or within an authorized firm so they can carry on reserved work and for freelancers like I said, there are certain conditions that they have to 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 abide by in order to carry on that work, and and Emma, Emma sort of mentioned it as well. It's in terms of sort of mitigating the risks around sort of consumer protection, and there are certain things that are there, uh, the controls around, or should we say, the prohibition that they can't hold or receive any client money. Um, you know that when you think about it, law firms traditionally receive and hold loads of client money. If you're a conveyancing firm, you've got mm. you know potentially millions or thousands of pounds passing through the firm every week. Um, the same if you're a personal injury firm. But it's not to say that these lawyers can't do that. You know that work. It's not to say that a freelancer can't do conveyancing. It's not to say that a freelancer can't do personal injury work. It just means that there are certain conditions, and they'll need to think about workarounds as well, and workarounds that are compliant. So technology will provide a solution to a point um, because it's about thinking about okay if I haven't got that face-to-face -face interaction with my client or I haven't got an office space anymore how can I still do due diligence through technology that sort of stuff what does the app allow me to do if I'm thinking about drafting something for my client whether it's a you know a trust document or something you know can I do that through through an app so that it's released confidentially to the you know mm -hmm. to the to the client so the concept of the work that they do there is there is the key distinction in terms of what different freelancers can do but there's nothing stopping now a solicitor from providing unreserved legal services outside of a regulated firm thank and you calling, thank and you calling themselves thank you for that. just 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 to make it clear for our audience because there are quite a few questions floating here limited companies out of the question is yeah. So if you're, yeah, this is, this is again important to understand. If you're doing the unreserved work, so if you were doing will writing or, you know, data protection, let's just keep that as our common examples. Mm. I, I could set up as Jatinder Loyal Limited if I wanted mm. to, because we're not, we're not restricting how the freelancer operates in that space. But if I was Jatinder Loyal thinking of doing, um, litigation, so I wanted to stand up in court and exercise my rights of audience, I would have to do that just as Jatinder Loyal. I couldn't do it through a service company or, or, or a, should we say, incorporated practice as a limited or LLP. It just have to be just Jatinder Loyal as a solicitor. I get it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just publishing the next uh, question, uh, which is, if you're thinking of working as a freelance solicitor, 
we will consider using a third party managed accounts. I'm just putting that forward to our audience and I'm coming back to you, Emma, because I heard you mentioning the legal access challenge. What's that about? Okay, so um, probably about two years ago, um, building on our existing innovation work, um, we decided we would want to put more of a focus on tech innovation and, and particularly to get ourselves in a position where we, we, we could understand the risks and challenges and, and opportunities of, of tech to change, uh, change the legal services marketplace. Um, so we took the opportunity of uh, partnering with Nesta Challenges to, uh, well, we bid for the money, but we part partnered with Nesta from a reg the Regulators Pioneer Fund and ran the Legal Access Challenge, which had the objective, A, of uh, accelerating, um, you know, accelerating solutions to the access to justice issue, tech solutions, um, through a package of financial and other support, but also critically, and I think we've already touched on on this, is was for us to build these networks with mm. with, with real innovators to actually get under the bonnet of what these challenges are, how, how we potentially need to adapt our regulatory approach, whether there were pinch points with our regulation, how we could engage with innovators, how we get, you know, how we get inside their heads um, and to sort of build a lasting community uh, that we could, you know, interact with just as we are now in, in the sense of developing what we need to do as a regulator going forward. So we, we had a huge, huge, hugely, um, we had 117 applicants, eight finalists. Uh, we ran events with with, with uh, applicants that didn't actually make make the fi final um, competition. Yeah, we, had, we we were one of the people. Yeah, who applied, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we've learned a huge amount. We've learned a huge amount about technology. We've we've learned a huge huge amount about the um, innovative ecosystem, and it, it's. It's uh, in, it's informed a massive amount of our thinking about our future strategy, which has tech and innovation at its at its core. And, and go is, on and on. Is that is that the, is that is that the only way you're supporting innovation? Like, do you have any guidance uh, or resources for developers okay, that, they, that can be so, active? Uh, up to, up to now, our focus on um, innovation has been supporting our regulated community, mm -hmm. obviously, to innovate through a range of different means, uh, waivers to our rules, one-to-one mm -hmm. um, -one guidance. Um, through, through the Legal Access Challenge, obviously, we've been thinking about how we've, we found issues that the broader inno 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 innovator community faces in terms of understanding our regulations. So going forward, th we're thinking about how we can adapt our approach in terms of guidance that a both helps our regulated firms, but potentially is a a, um, a resource that's available for for innovators. And um, we've got all sorts of ideas um, in our in our business plan about how we develop our guidance and resource package going forward. Um, so kind of watch this space that's coming out shortly. Good, good to hear. Good to hear, Emma. Uh, Guy, I've got a question to you. Uh, I mean, often people would uh, likely consider freelancers as uh, people that work on their own, uh, almost like lonely wolves. So what, what is your perception on that? And can use uh, can tech be used uh, to allow people to work together but still be freelancers? Yeah, that's a nice question, and it's often uh, something that that I hear. You know, the it, the the people get scared to go freelance. They like the uh, community of being in a law firm and working with other people, um, and certainly it's something that we address in our own product and in in our design. The, we create this Slack-like environment where people can, uh, where various solicitors can get together in small groups and quite quickly create virtual law firms. Um, and then, you know, with the help of Shield Pay, uh, the ability for them to create third-party managed accounts almost on the fly, um, and to sort of recreate a lot of the professional networks that, that existed. Um, I was inspired in a way 
by a lot of the sort of freelance lawyers that I that I worked with right at the beginning, and they were and I started to understand the way they sent work to one another, the way they um, grouped together. You know, five people who went to law school and knew each other their whole careers would very often pass the same cases with uh, within the same circles, and so that's something that we we obviously addressed a lot in our product. Um, I know that there's there's um, Ian Locke, for example, is uh, is creating his own sub network of um, of freelance solicitors and then he's going to you know be working with these solicitors to create a community to get them uh, you know deal prices on things like insurance and i'm sure that there are a lot more people that are going to be doing um, similar things and that's something that we we really think a lot about um as we're building we're building a very social product uh, yeah you'll see it in a moment and you've seen it before um but for sure uh, we, we like the idea of bringing people together lawyers helping lawyers um in a way that that maybe thinks a little outside of the, the traditional law firm model thank you